Hello and welcome back to the next sub-module in the module introduction. Now what we're going to talk about is uh, subtitled ASIC versus what? Which we're going to talk about the different ways to implement an ASIC and how you choose amongst those different ways. So application specific integrated circuit means exactly that a chip designed to perform a particular operation or set of operations uh, as opposed to general purpose integrated circuits. Uh, though it is not software programmable to perform any operation, there usually is an embedded CPU in an ASIC to handle things that don't need hardware levels of performance, such as overhead management functions. In this class, I consider FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays, as a subset of ASICs because their design entry point is much the same. However, some do consider them as a separate category. In contrast, general purpose integrated circuits are designed to be software programmable so they can perform any function compatible with their, uh, the level of performance they can achieve. The obvious example are microprocessors, all the way from uh, high-end processors for a service through to processors and washing machines to perform the rudimentary functions needed within. Uh, classic examples, of course, include the Intel processor range and the ARM processor range commonly found in mobile devices. There also is a subclass of processors called digital signal processors. These are still programmed devices, uh, but, but the, the features in the instruction set architecture are more tuned towards digital signal processing functions, such as those needed in multimedia. Uh, a big application of such processes are sensor processing and, uh, and the DSP functions for communications. Another big range of general purpose integrated circuits are graphics computation units, or GPUs. Traditionally, these were used just to accelerate graphics functions in that notebook and desktop computers, but increasingly the, the arithmetic, the parallel arithmetic capabilities of such units are being exploited to speed up arithmetic heavy functions such as numerical simulations. Of course, such programmable processes such as these have to be complemented by other general purpose integrated circuits uh, such as DRAM and SRAM chips and non-volatile memory chips such as flash memory. Here's some examples of ASICs or application specific integrated circuits. Video processors are a common application. Uh, the televisions are full of, uh, uh, have strong ASIC components to them, as do most uh, digital video recording devices. The graphics processor is an example I've already given. It's designed using ASIC design styles. The converged device in your mobile phone, uh, which has DSP in it for processing signals, a controller, different codecs to record images and video and, and to uh, manage the uh, mobile data, these are examples of ASICs. Encryption processors. The networking industry is a very heavy user of ASICs, at least in terms of the amount of ASIC design goes that, that they do. Uh, unfortunately for them, the volumes they produce are, are relatively modest. But there are a lot of ASICs in networking equipment to manage traffic, uh, to, to manage the packets, to route the packets, uh, to manage traffic flow, and often even increasingly to perform higher level functions. And of course, though a CPU is not an example of an ASIC, it is however designed using ASIC design methodologies. Though the, the tool flows are a little more sophisticated than a standard ASIC tool flow, companies like Intel and IBM uh, are using RTL as their design entry point uh, for, to design their high-end processors. And of course, the reason why we do this is an ASIC implementation can outperform software by several orders of magnitude. We've done AC implementations for speech processing that, that take capabilities that you would not be able to run even in a multi-core desktop computer and, and achieve levels of performance uh, well beyond a multi-level, a, a multi-CPU desktop computer, but can be done in just a couple of square millimeters of silicon. So they outperform software by many orders of magnitude, both in terms of performance and in terms of power efficiency. But of course, the downside of this 
is it takes a lot more engineering effort to design hardware than it does to write software that goes into a general purpose machine. So let's go through the ASIC styles and then contrast and compare them in terms of how you, you would choose between them for a particular project. Let me start with the rarest style and that is full custom ASICs in which every transistor is designed and drawn by hand. In fact there's an example from some of our own work on the top right there. This is typically only done for the analog and very high speed portions of ASICs. And in fact it's often increasingly done by companies that specialize in this topical area and, and then sell the designs as intellectual property or IP uh, to system integrators. Uh, examples of this, of course, include all analog functions, high-speed uh, I.O., uh, phase lock loops, uh, some aspects of memory interfaces, and so on. These, of course, give the highest performance but take a very long design time. They're very expensive to make. And, of course, a full set of masks are required for fabrication. You have to do a full layout. In fact, one of part of the chip on the top right is shown at the transistor level uh, down below. The next, and a very and the most common style of ASIC, is what is called a standard cell-based ASIC, sometimes called cell-based or sometimes called semi-custom. The idea here is that someone else goes off and designs a set of standalone gates. These become these then become standard cells that are placed into a library. Then you write your RTL. And the synthesis tools choose amongst these gates to implement your RTL. Since the gates have layout associated with them, the final chip layout is then assembled from these pre-designed gates. So for example, at the bottom here, I have the layout for a D flip-flop and the layout for a NOR gate done in a standard cell type fashion. Now those of you who have done VLSI design will know that the, the, the top rail on these is the uh, VDD rail and the bottom rail is the ground or VCC rail. Do you notice something about the rails on, on these two designs as compared to these two standard cells as they're, they're placed on this page here? They're the same. The basic idea in, in place and route is that if you place an OR gate next to a D flip-flop, you just put it to its side, that automatically connects up VDD and ground to uh, provide those functions for an entire row of standard gates. You then come in and route wires to the inputs and outputs of the standard gates. Uh, for example, you can see these wires hanging here. They're obviously an input or output to this D flip-flop. Similarly, the wires there. So that's how these uh, predefined standard cells that someone else has designed are integrated to create a standard cell ASIC. In addition, there are other functions that don't suit themselves to place and route. Uh, some arithmetic functions, such as big multipliers, uh, some uh, obviously memories, uh, come arrays, and these are sometimes tied together uh, from what are called macro cells. An example of a standard cell ASIC is shown on the top right. In the top two thirds of this chip, you can see the, you can make out actually the rows of standard cells as they're wired together. And obviously in the bottom, you have some macro cell generated tiled arrays, most probably SRAMs. This of course is a relatively small standard cell ASIC a large one, even ones we design, uh, you wouldn't be able to see this level of detail. So what you often get is uh, a system on a chip, such as uh, shown here. You have your uh, 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 standard cell rows, you might have a CPU core, which you bought as a complete block from someone. You might have bought that as uh, RTL, in which case it would also be a set of standard cell rows. Or you might have purchased that as what's called a hard macro from one of these specialized vendors. You have your memories, you might have some specialized arithmetic units, you might have some specialized uh, hard macro uh, PLLs and things like that. But the idea is that this puts together a total floor plan 
uh, for an ASIC between these t different types of functions. And again, the key is here, the standard cell designs, the usage of the standard cells, are synthesized from a register transfer language description of the design. And similar to a full custom ASIC, a full set of masks, which these days off, uh, number in the many tens, is still required. Let's talk about that just a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go through the complete chip fabrication flow, though many of you are familiar with the basic concepts here. Um, the idea is a chip is made by successively imaging a mask, or through going through a set of masks, onto a silicon wafer, so as to define the different functions that go into make a semiconductor circuit. So here's an example. This is a layer, which is in, in turn uh, made into a set of masks. In this particular example, the way you would make this chip is you start with a, a, a piece of silicon that was p-doped. You would then put in, you would then have a mask that defines where the end wells are. You would then have a mask that defines where the gates are. In this case, the gates are fabricated with polysilicon. Uh, the polysilicon is placed on top of the silicon. Then another set of masks is used to define the N-type and P-type implants, then in turn define the uh, PFET and NFET. Then another set of masks is used to define where the metals are run. And then yet an additional set of masks are used to define these holes in the metals, which are then filled with metal so as to create a contact from uh, the metal that's above an insulator uh, to the underlying N-type or P-type material or polysilicon. So here we have a layout with uh, several masks involved in it and those masks are successively printed with the appropriate implants and metals and, and other materials in a fabrication facility uh, in order to create a silicon chip. Again, the distinction here is that the previous two design styles, the full custom and standard cell, require a full set of masks, even though in the standard cell design uh, the, the information source for the standard cells is a defined set of cells, usually 30 to 100 or so standard cells. Cell-based ASICs are typically done using what's called the Fabulous Semiconductor Company model. The idea here is that there are many companies that do design, but there's only a few companies that do the fab. Uh, for example, TSMC, Global Foundries, or IBM. Uh, and also Intel is now in the fab business. Uh, and the, uh, the company doing the design either sends the fab, a full set of mask information, or sometimes it will work a bit higher up the food chain, for example, sending uh, a gate, a net list, that is uh, what, the, what the gates are and how they're connected, and, and the uh, company in turn helps with place and route and so on. We'll be talking about the uh, steps in it later. But in general, these days there's only a few fabs, particularly the more advanced nodes, uh, and many more companies doing design. The next style I want to talk about are gate array based ASICs. The idea here is the transistor level layers stay the same from different application to different application. What actually happens is a sea of logic gates are predefined uh, in these wafers. The wafers are pre-made and actually stored in the fab. So for example, you will have, you will have an AND gate at a certain location, and you will have an OR gate at the circuit location, and if your design needs an AND gate, the AND gate then gets wired in. If it needs an OR gate, the OR gate then gets wired in. However, of course, many of the gates that are pre-made in the transistor level layers are not used. So the functional density of a gate array ASIC is quite a bit lower than that of a standard cell ASIC. A, a big portion of the gates that are predefined never get used. However, design is much simpler. Uh, though the entry level point is RTL still, 
in the, in the, in the end, all the, all the designer's tools have to do is to find the wiring in the vias to implement the desired function. Because the wire, because most of the, the uh, gates are unused, the wires tend to be longer, uh, and thus the cell-based designs uh, tend to be slower and somewhat more power-hungry uh, than standard cell-based designs. In this last point here, I still emphasize the design entry is still registered transfer language, and in fact, most of the tools look and feel the same as for the standard cell-based design. So here's a couple of examples. Here's a company called Chip Express at the top here. Uh, they have pre-built wafers with a sea of macros, that is a sea of gates in them, uh, uh, and other functions such as phase lock loops and clock distribution and so on. And four metal layers, and these, all these are predefined sitting in the, in the fab as unfinished wafers. When the designer goes through the tool flow, he or she will put out those two final metal layers that are customized for the application. And thus, you can go from design, uh, from, from design concept to chips that you can test with only having to fabricate four unique masks and run those four unique masks in the fab. This is a lot quicker and a lot cheaper than having to do the full mask set required for standard cell-based designs. Another company, which is local to North Carolina, has tried Semiconductor. They only have one metal layer that's required for customization. And thus, they can, they can just uh, turn around a chip. You can go from sending them a CAD file to having chips in your hand with only two weeks. And this again is because uh, sets of wafers with most of the wafers pre-made are sitting in fabs uh, in, in, the, in the companies that uh, these, uh, these, uh, these vendors use uh, for the gate arrays. The last style I want to talk about are programmable logic devices, referred to as PLDs. The most common example with is an FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Array. These require no masks at all to fabricate. These are off-the-shelf ICs that the designer programs in order to implement a logic function. You're capable of implementing approximately 100,000 plus gates in the high-end versions of these FPGAs. However, there's a lot of overhead with creating programmable logic. Thus, their the high power consumption, the chips are quite large and thus have a high per unit cost. The wiring is quite complex to create, so you end up with quite slow chips as well. Here's an example of the internal architecture of an FPGA. Uh, this is actually an example from Xilinx. On the left shows the two types of blocks that make up a simple FPGA. The CLBs are configurable logic blocks, and I'll come back to them in a moment. The PSMs are programmable switch matrices. They're basically crossbars in a sense that can connect any set of wires coming into the PSM block in order to create customized routing. So the wires exist there in the, in the FPGA and these PSMs are used as cross points to connect up wires so you can build up wiring paths from CLB to CLB. Well it's not showing the diagram on the left of the IO of the CLBs themselves. An example of a CLB is shown on the right. What you see on the left of this, where it says logic function, these are basically small SRAMs, four input, one output SRAMs. You might recall that any logic function can be implemented as a lookup table in a memory. And that's exactly what's done here. These SRAMs are pro programmed through a set of CAD tools to implement um, predefined combinational logic functions, admittedly small ones, these are both four input, one output, but any four input, one output logic function can be fit in each of those SRAMs. You can then see a set of muxes to create some steering logic in the middle there. Uh, one of the things these, for example, can enable is, is the uh, carry chain on a, on a carry adder. And then on the right, you can see two flip-flops associated with this particular CLB. So you can see that this CLB can implement two small four input logic functions and has two flip-flops and a bunch of steering logic. 
The IOs of these CLBs are then connected to the wires shown on the left and the program will switch matrices are programmed, again using SRAMs, to connect up end to end an output of a CLB to the input of another CLB on the chip. Put this all together and you can implement uh, quite complex logic functions, albeit at a, at a very low equivalent density, in an FPGA. Now because you have to predefine all this stuff in order to build what's equivalent to only a handful of gates in terms of what you see on this page here, the functional densities of these FPGAs are quite low. Now, for example, on, on the uh, right hand side, the configurable logic block, this is implementing the equivalent of only about three or four logic gates, if you're lucky. And the wiring is quite a bit of overhead. And because of these programmable switch matrices, the wiring is quite slow and also quite power hungry. So in all in all, you give up a lot of performance uh, compared with the standard cell design to use an FPGA, but you can turn this around very quickly. Uh, you can have the FPGA sitting in your lab, write RTL in the morning, in the afternoon have a working part, at least with something of a modest scale. So this brings us to the uh, pros and cons of these different implementation styles. Standard cell ASIC gives you the highest performance and the lowest power consumption. Uh, you, you, know, you can have you know, hundreds of millions of logic gates to billions of logic gates in generations just coming up operating at multi gigahertz rates, though half to one gigahertz is the most common uh, clock speeds. Uh, power consumption is by far the lowest and they give the lowest low, uh, high volume cost. However, they have a very high design cost. And we'll come back to that in the later sub-module. Quite a lot of sophistication from a design team and often take many months, if not years or fractions of a year, to design. And even once you finish the design, you have to fabricate a full set of masks and run those full set of masks through the fab before you get your first chip back. So it takes at least four weeks uh, to get the first chip back from fabrication so you can then test it and, and, and debug it if, if, if you find faults. However, there are many functions that can only be met filled by using a standard cell ASIC. Graphics processors, CPUs, uh, mobile phones, a standard cell ASIC is the, the only way to either meet the performance requirement or the power consumption requirement in those applications. FPGA on the right hand side is almost the inverse opposite. Very low design costs. Uh, you can do this with small teams. The CAD tools are very cheap and in fact they're often free. Um, and you can go from having a design ready to your first part in zero time. However, the performance is quite low. You tend to only have 100,000 or so logic gates. They tend to only operate at around 100 megahertz or so. And the power per unit function is at least 10 times that of an ASIC. These are also large complex chips, so they have a very high per unit cost. There are some FPGAs that sell for over $20,000 per FPGA. One specific advantage of FPGAs, however, um, mentioned at the bottom there, is that they're particularly useful in markets that change fast and obviously they're useful markets that have low volumes. Gate arrays of course in, in, the, in between. In terms of design cost, tends towards FPGA, fairly low design costs. In terms of design time, it's very close to FPGA, doesn't take a lot of time to design and from sending the CAD files to the factory to getting your parts back might be as little as one week. In terms of cost per unit, they're closer to standard cells, though not as close. In terms of power consumption, they're closer to standard cells than FPGAs. Performance levels tend to be quite modest. Actually, this is a side effect, really, of the fact that most gate array technologies are, are done in older uh, semiconductor nodes. Here's an example plotting the average selling price of a chip implemented in these three different styles against the production volume of that chip. You notice it says average selling price includes NRE. 
NRE stands for non-recurring engineering. It refers to the cost of doing design, the cost of the first mast set, and so on. Obviously, this cost has to be amortized across the number of chips that you produce. Give an extreme example, if you're making only one chip and you spend $40 million designing that chip, then that one chip costs $40 million. In contrast, if you make 40 million of those chips, the amortized design cost per chip is only $1. So volume makes a very big difference in terms of the, total, in terms of the average selling price of a standard cell design. Makes less of a difference for a gate array, in this case their express array, and much less difference for an FPGA. So you can see here for example, at low volumes, in this particular example, 1000 units, the FPGA has the lowest per unit price because the NRE is the lowest. However, it doesn't gain much from volume. Uh, all you do is amortize the low NRE across more units and in high volumes the FPGA is very expensive per part because of the native cost of buying each F FPGA chip. In contrast, the standard cell has a very high, high cost if your, modest, if your volumes are modest but the lowest cost if your volumes are high. And in fact, I suspect the cost difference will be higher than illustrated here. In contrast, again, the gate array is in the middle. For low volumes, it has a somewhat higher per unit cost than the FPGA, but it crosses over fairly quickly. In this particular example, I, th I think that's around 2,000 units. And then it's closer to the cost curve of the standard cell design. Now, I've got to be a little careful here. Uh, you know, cost alone doesn't drive these markets. As I was mentioning earlier, there are some markets that can only be met by the performance and power level capabilities of a standard cell design. And there are some markets that need the agility of rapid redesign FPGAs in order to meet them. However, price is a big issue. So for example, the military market tends to be very heavy users of FPGAs these days uh, because they uh, tend to have low production volumes. So there's some comments on this. Uh, the market is dominated by standard cell ASICs and FPGAs. Uh, the idea is generally that standard cell ASICs are used for the high performance, high volume applications that can justify the NRE. The FPGAs are used for the low volume applications in which the low performance is still suitable. Many consider FPGAs separate from ASICs. For purposes of course, they're, they're not because the design entry point is much the same. However, in general, an ASIC team is very different in character from an FPGA team. An FPGA team, frankly, requires a low level design skills, especially in running the back end tools, that is, the actual tools that produce the physical design. You need much less verification before, quote unquote, going to the factory. Because the ASIC, you can test the actual part very quickly and easily. Co uh, correction, the FPGA, you can test the ASIC actual part very quickly and easily. Whereas, on the other hand, the ASIC, you're going to spend weeks waiting for it to come back from the fab. Then it'll take you weeks to bring it up and start testing it before you can start debugging any problems with it. So you want to spend a lot of effort getting bugs out of the standard cell ASIC before sending it to the factory. FPGAs are a very low cost barrier to entry. And in fact, is for um, a few hundred dollars, you can go off and design FPGAs yourself at home, quote unquote, in your garage. However, of course, FPGAs are much lower performance level, which again makes them easier to design. However, they don't have much difference from the purpose of this course, because the actual RTL design function is done very much the same for FPGAs as it is for standard cell designs. In fact, synthesis has very much the same approach as well. In fact, the synthesis tools where we'll be using in this class, are, at least the synopsis tools we'll be using, can be targeted either for FPGAs or for ASICs. Though often in practice, you use different synthesis tools for FPGAs. And you'll have an opportunity to investigate that later in the semester. So now I'm going to summarize this module before allowing you to do the submodule quiz. ASICs can be built on different styles and they're summarized here. Full custom is used for specialized functions 
as part of a chip. There's rarely an entire chip that's full custom. Standard cell designs require a full set of masks, but the logic cells are pre-designed. Gate arrays, the logic cells are pre-made, and the wiring is specified from the design. And finally, full programmable gate arrays are off-the-shelf chips that can be programmed to perform logic functions and interconnect functions. This table is, it summarizes the different end capabilities of each of these technologies. Look at these line by line. Design capture. In a full custom design is transistor level design. And the other three is RTL as the design entry point. In terms of design cost, the standard cell design is the highest design cost where the FPGA is lowest and the gate array not much above it. In terms of the design cycle, the standard cell and custom designs have a very long design cycle, whereas the FPGAs can be operated on very quickly, even on a, almost on a daily basis. Because the design cycle is so long for the standard cell and custom designs, you spend a lot of effort on verification. The gate array, you'll spend a little more effort on verification than for an FPGA, but, but, but not a lot. Uh, it, it's, it's still, since you're going to get the part back in a week, um, it's, it's easy to test the actual hardware than a simulation of it. In terms of performance, the number of logic gates per chip is in the billions for standard cells, but only in the 100,000 range for FPGAs, and somewhat more for gate arrays. The clock frequencies can be in the gigahertz range for standard cells versus circa 100 megahertz for FPGAs, and not much more for gate arrays. Power consumption per function, a standard cell-based design can consume 10 times less power per function than an FPGA. And a gate array actually not much more than that. So it tends to be used a lot for low volume, low power applications. Now what I suggest you do is uh, do the sub-module quiz uh, before transitioning to the next sub-module. Thank you very much.